Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. We'll read from the Psalms tonight. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have been. Put not your trust in the princes of men, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to his earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Thy God, O Sion, to all generations. Praise be to the Lord. To our through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Uh, our speaker this evening is the director of the Westminster Institute, a former director of Voice of America. Robert Riley has taught at the National Defense University and has served in the White House and the office of the Sec Secretary of Defense. Mr. Riley is a member of the board of the Middle East Media Research Institute. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Reader's Digest, the National Review, among many other publications. His most recent book, a revised and expanded version of his 2002 work, Surprised by Beauty, was published in April this year. We're delighted to have him back at the Institute. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Riley. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Father Hezekiah. What a delightful surprise to see you here. And it al always, always is a privilege to be at the Institute of Catholic Culture. I hope when I die I go to heaven, but if this is the closest I can get, I'm, I'm <laughs> very happy to be here. And it's always an inspiration to be with you particularly with what we're facing this evening, uh, it's particularly good to be with you as we shall witness indeed the abuse of language. Uh, tonight, what, what is the debate, at nine or? Nine what time? Nine it is at nine o'clock. Well, I'll try to talk past nine <laughs> so you don't have to do that. Well, you know, someone shared with me the cover of The Economist uh, this week, uh, The Art of the Lie, Post-Truth Politics in the Age of Social Media. It's nice that they can still distinguish between lies and truth, um, which is something that the abuse of language doesn't allow you to do. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is not so much a lie, as in one of our presidential candidates lying, or the lies we've all told in our own lives. It's not so much that I'm going to address as systemic lying, a lie as a replacement for reality, and how language is used to instantiate that false reality. And that, of course, is some of what Joseph Pieper was talking about in his brilliant monograph, which gave the title for this talk this evening, 
the abuse of language, abuse of power. You know, it's only 55 pages long, but it's priceless. As always with Joseph Pieper, it is written with such clarity, this great 20th century German philosopher. Many of his works are, are short, uh, they're all clear, and they're extremely profound. I'm going to begin in a little different way, uh, not with the ancient roots of this problem in sophistry, as is the way that Joseph Pieper began, but in something more recent, indeed in an American experience, and in, and in my experience, because in my work in government, I spent a great deal of time in public diplomacy, the U.S. Information Agency, trying to explain the United States to the world, trying to represent our cause in the world, and to articulate that in ways in which people could understand. Of course, doing that during the Cold War and then now in the recent contest with this radical <laughs> Islamic terrorism, uh, the United States had to do this earlier. And first we begin with World War I, when President Woodrow Wilson began the Committee on Public Information to generate support for World War I. Now it was run by a certain George Creel, who called it the world's greatest adventure in advertising. Interesting angle on a war. He employed Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, whose reflections on his experiences show how clearly the effort was intermixed with Freud's concept of the unconscious as well as with notions of behaviorism and the ideas of Ivan Pavlov. Remember Pavlov's dog, you can get so, all right. In his 1928 book, Propaganda, Bernays wrote, quote, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, that's us, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing about it? The recent practice of propaganda has proved that it is possible, at least up to a certain point and within certain limits, unquote. Well, Edward Bernays labeled this scientific technique he came up with, quote, the engineering of consent, unquote, the engineering of consent. He wrote that, quote, human nature is readily subject to modification, unquote. Now that rings a little bell with um, John Dewey, who said that human nature is to have no nature. Well, if you have no nature, you should be susceptible to modification, correct? And what better way to do this than the engineering of consent? Joseph Goebbels agreed. And Bernays, somewhat upset, said that Goebbels, quote, was using my book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, as a basis for the destructive campaign against the Jews of Germany, unquote. Well, Bernays was shocked by this, but he should not have been surprised. Engineering works anywhere, building anything. Bernays went on to become the most renowned man in public relations. Indeed, he was called the father of public relations and was widely lauded for his successful efforts to get women to smoke Lucky Strike cigarettes in his famous Torches of Freedom campaign. 
Now, in World War II, the Office of War Information uh, began and operated somewhat with the same assumptions. As one writer said, coming from a consumer marketing background, they, that is the staff of the Office of War Information, <coughs> brought with them the insouciant belief that the U.S. advertising techniques would work in the wider world. If you could sell it in Kalamazoo, you could sell it in Karachi, Kuala Lumpur, and Kyoto. Unquote. Sell it? What? The it of what was being sold really did not matter. Content does not matter. Emotional engineering, after all, is the same everywhere. Just as advertising manipulates the passions for economic purposes, public diplomacy, advertising can manipulate the passions for political purposes, whatever those purposes may be. Now, the bias uh, toward, towards advertising infused at its origin with a confusing mix of behavioral and Freudian notions is worth mentioning because it comes with certain presuppositions about human nature. The principal assumption of this kind of advertising, according to its own progenitors, is that man is a creature of passion, not reason. The unconscious drives people to behave the way they do. Man is fundamentally subrational. The so-called reason we refer to is the product of unreason, and therefore can't be understood in rational terms, but in irrational terms rooted in this unconscious or the subconscious, right? To the extent to which it is based upon these assumptions, obviously uh, advertising operates as a form of manipula manipulation designed to elicit certain responses in the target audience. Advertising doesn't appeal to reason, but to desire. Even for computers, this is apparently true. Michael Dell, the founder of the famous computer name a computer by that name said of his new consumer products that they were intended to generate, quote, consumer lust, unquote. I suppose that depends on how many gigs it has, right? I mean, what, <laughs> lust for a computer? You can get confused about a lot of things, but uh, he wants to generate that. So the ideal outcome is not rational calculation, but emotional compulsion. It wishes to condition behavior, not to elicit it through deliberative choice. The boast of advertising is that it can do this for any product or its competitor. I can do it for Crest or Colgate. It doesn't, right? It's the technique. Thus, Goebbels could use the value-free engineering of consent to prepare for the destruction of the Jews, while Bernays could use it to promote lucky strike torches of freedom. To the ancients, this was known as the art of sophistry. And therefore, we arrive at the topic of Pieper's talk, the abuse of language, the abuse of power. Of course, the purpose of the abuse of language is power. But all of this is, as I just indicated briefly in terms of Bernays' technique of engineering consent, are the presuppositions about man's nature and about reality that underlay all of this. And this is some of, we're going to get into this, some of this is going to be difficult material, but I hope you'll bear with me uh, because it will illuminate some of what 
is taking place in the displacement of reality today with an unreality that is being imposed upon us and that we're being coerced to accept. Now, Hebert refers to the ancient sophists at the time of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Let's talk about one of them, famous sophist Protagoras. This is from a Platonic dialogue. And Protagoras says, quote, whatever in any particular city is considered just and admirable is just and admirable in that city and for so long as the convention remains in place, unquote. You got it? That, that what's just and admirable is only just and admirable there, and it's a product of convention. Because you could go over to another city, and what is just and admirable will be different over there. And that is just and admirable for so long as that convention obtains. You're shaking your head. <coughs> I feel like shaking my head, too. So Protagoras' thesis, and this single statement is the thing of which he is, for which he is most famous, was, quote, man is the measure of all things, of those things that are, that they are, and of those things that are not, that they are not, unquote. Ah, so man is the measure of all things. And in this way, it appears that, you know, he, he seems to be able to constitute reality. Not to conform himself to it, but to actually form it himself. Now, if man is the highest thing, how ought he to behave? And here we have another famous sophist, Gorgias, in, in the, Gor the dialogue called Gorgias, the sophist is Callicles, and he's talking to Socrates. And here's what Callicles says, quote, He who would live rightly should let his desires be as strong as possible and not chasten them, and should be able to minister to them when they are at their height by reason of his manliness and intelligence, and satisfy each appetite in turn with what it desires. Unquote. Did you get that? So what is right, living rightly means the satisfaction of your desires as they arise uh, most strongly, and that you have the means to satisfy. It sounds like the Edward Bernays of his time, doesn't it? That this, this is, a, that Callicles is a creature of advertising, except he's in control of the products with which he's going to satisfy his passions. Now, Socrates refers to another in a, di a dialogue with Thrasymachus who gives the teaching that is inherent in Callicles' statement. And what does Thrasymachus says? He says, right is the rule of the stronger. Well, if man is the measure of all things, <clears throat> certainly the strongest man gets to say what is right. And so in his city... He establishes the convention of what is admirable and what is just because he has the power with which to do so. That is the essence and heart of sophism. Now Socrates uh, responded to Callicles this way. <clears throat> and the culmination of the case as stated, the life of catamites is not that awful, shameful, and wretched. 
Or will you dare to assert that these are happy if they can freely indulge their wants? We know what he's talking about here. Catamites, sex with boys, right? Or MSM, as it's talked about today. So if right is the rule of the stronger and one can freely indulge his desires, does that constitute reality? Or in Socrates' attempt to shame Callicles, is he not pointing to some standard outside that is superior to the satisfaction of these desires? Something in the constitution of human nature itself that makes the behavior of the sexual use of boys shameful because it is wrong. That's just one point at which Socrates uh, confronts the sophists. Uh, the, the, the Socratic dialogues in many respects are a constant battle against the sophists. So <clears throat> in counter to this is not only uh, Socrates and Plato, but Aristotle, who famously said, politics is not the highest thing because man is not the highest thing. So if man is not the highest thing, then right cannot be the rule of the stronger. Something else, something outside of man, something higher than man determines what is right, what is just. So it's the content. There's content to justice, not just convention. Now, pertaining this to this subject that we have tonight about language, Aristotle says, obviously man is a political animal in a sense in which a bee is not, or other gregarious animal. Nature has endowed man alone among the animals with the power of speech. For the real difference between man and other animals is that humans alone have perception of good and evil, just and unjust. It is the sharing of a common view in these matters that makes a household and a state. Aha! So content constitutes the importance of what is said, not simply the way in which it is said. So the very purpose of language is exactly in addressing the questions of justice and what is right. And obviously those discussions take place among human beings, all of whom have this extraordinary power of speech precisely to address what is right and what is wrong. And in addition to which, of course, both Socrates and Aristotle agreed that men's souls are ordered to the same end and that this end that inheres in human nature transcends any political order. Therefore, there is a single standard of justice that obtains everywhere at all times for every one. Were this not so, in what way could we speak of a human nature other than that we share the same end as human beings? And so Aristotle wrote this electrifying line, which is at the foundation of our civilization to the extent to which it still exists, quote, universal law is the law of nature. There really is, as everyone to some extent divines, a natural justice and injustice that is binding on all men 
even on those who have no association or covenant with each other, unquote. So, could we have anything more uh, explicitly antithetical to the view of the sophists than what Aristotle just said? Now, <clears throat> this idea of the purpose of language remained at the foundation of Western civilization through the Middle Ages. And it was rearticulated by Thomas Aquinas, most particularly, and I will um, address here in a moment what he said about language and how it apprehends reality. That language is the, the mind knowing in conformance with the thing known. That knowledge is an accurate apprehension of what exists outside the mind. It's not that I just think I have wine in my glass. I know there is, but let me make sure. <laughs> and the reason I'm going to slog along on these issues, some of which will sound so obvious to you, you'll wonder why is Riley wasting our time, it's so that you can appreciate how radical the change was when what I just said is refuted and denied in the late Middle Ages, the consequence of which was that Christendom itself was split asunder. And we will go from Aquinas to William of Ockham to Luther and Hobbes and to some of the manifestations of these deformed teachings about the nature of reality and therefore of language that has brought us to the situation in which we are. Now, now in what way do words grasp uh, the things that uh, they represent? For instance, uh, humanity. Do, does humanity exist as um, Plato thought as an ideal form somewhere? Does it have a separate metaphysical existence from uh, you as a man or you as a woman or any of you of whom we would say you are humans? So is there a, uh, a separate existing ideal humanity uh, in which you simply share. And both Aristotle and Aquinas said, no, it, it only exists in specific and particular human beings. So humanity exists to the extent that individual humans exist. Now that doesn't mean that uh, human nature is some sort of construct or convention of the mind, that nature of uh, humanity makes each individual what they are as a human. So it, that nature is inherent in them, and that's the way in which this exists. Now, how is it that... Um, how is it that our ideas of things conform with what they are? How is it that the, our word tree conforms with a tree? How does this all work? How, how is it that our minds can connect with the reality external to it and apprehend it accurately? What's going on when we do that in the, our use of language? And the ancient Greeks would say, indeed did say, I think Anaximander may have been the first, 
when they were puzzling over how it is that reality is intelligible to us. So they came up with the idea that behind reality is a intelligence. And they first used the name Logos for this intelligence. So behind everything is Logos, which of course is the Greek word for reason or word. So the intelligibility of things within our experiences, experience is because behind these things that we perceive is an intelligence that somehow put them forth. Now Aquinas came up with a little different way of saying this. He said that we can think about reality because it was first thought of by God that this reality in which we live and exist is the product of a divine intelligence. Now this is one of the extremely important, somewhat hard to explain, essential issues at the heart of our faith uh, and of a good deal of our civilization before it went off the rail. When I say that um, it is the product of thought, it does not mean that um, it wasn't willed. God has intellect and will. The key question is whether which of the two is primary, the intellect or the will? And the entire Christian tradition, at least up to the late Middle Ages, was that God's intellect was primary. And his will executed what his intellect conceived, you see? And it is because that it was so that reality was intelligible, because it was the product of the thought of this intellect. See, that's, that's what made reality rational. That's the rational principle in reality. Now, if it's the other way around, we have a problem. If the will is primary and the intellect is subordinate to it, then the will, the, the intellect is simply a servant of the will. It simply... Um, provides for the will the means by which to execute what has been willed. And if the, if the will is primary, that means things are constituted by a willfulness rather than by a reason. In other words, if I had to come up with a theology for Thrasymachus or Callicles who say right is the rule of the stronger, it would be this, to say in God, uh, the will is primary. And why is God right? Well, because he's the strongest. In other words, there would be no relationship between the exercise of that will and anything intelligible or rational. I think that's confusing enough, isn't it? No. no. All right, well, let me get back to some actual uh, material here that may help illustrate this fact. Now, so if creation is the product of thought, then it can be apprehended by thinking. That's how it works. Now, within this view, naming is essential to knowing. Here we get back to language. And here is one of the most extraordinary, beautiful things I have ever read anyone say about language, and it was by Etienne Gilson, the great French philosopher in the 20th century. Quote, man alone has been created with a knowing mind and a loving heart. In order that by knowing and loving all things in God, 
he might refer them to their origin, which is at the same time their end. His essential function is to lend his voice to an otherwise speechless creation to help each thing in publicly confessing its deepest and most secret meaning, or rather its essence. For each of them is a word, while man alone can say it." Unquote. Should I repeat that, or do you? Okay, let's, because this is. Send you a copy. Man alone has been created with a knowing mind and a loving heart in order that by knowing and loving all things in God, <clears throat> he might refer them to their origin, which is at the same time their end. Well, their origin and end. He's talking about God. His, man's essential function is to lend his voice to an otherwise speechless creation to help each thing in publicly confessing its deepest and most secret meaning, or rather its essence, for each of them is a word while man alone can say it. Do you see this? God creates things through his word. As we know, in the beginning was the word, logos, Right in the Greek Gospel of St. John. So that logos that's behind the intelligible reality that Anaximander and Heraclitus and the rest of them were wondering about, all of a sudden comes walking through a door to St. John the Baptist. And St. John... And the gospel says, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was God, and all things were made through him as the word, as Logos. So this is what Etienne saw is referring to in a way, that each thing is a word. The tree is a word. God's word constitutes that tree. The deer I see in my yard across the forests which give me such joy. They're words, they're, they're words, but they can't speak. Only we can speak. And by naming them, we give them voice. That's what Jesus is saying. And do you see the beauty and power of language in his magnificent reflection? These Creatures are constituted by God's word, and by naming them and speaking the word, we share in a way, as only man can, of all of the creatures in the universe, we share in a way because we have the word that names them. You see the significance now of this beauty and power of language. And this, of course, is the, the significance of man's power, of Adam's power to name the animals in Genesis, right? And they were what he named them. There's no disjunction, disjunction between the word and what the thing is. Now, Aquinas, reflecting on this very episode in Genesis, argues from the fact that Adam named the animals that he had to know the very natures of the animals. That is, the name should be congruent with the nature of the thing. And that's what Gilson meant here when he said, confessing its deepest and most secret meaning, or rather its essence. So the naming of a thing is the apprehension of its essence. That's how if you can name a tree, and you see another tree, you'll know what it is because it has the same essence. So that's what language is, the apprehension of the essence that makes the thing what it is. 
So man knows through their essence, things through their essences by the apprehension of his reason and the use of words. Now, the theology behind this that I alluded to was, was uh, the, the actual words of Aquinas from the Summa Theologica are that um, since God is logos or reason itself, quote, will follows upon intellect. Will follows upon intellect. Reason rules, the will follows. Thought or knowledge predominates. Knowledge is the foundation of being, not will. Now, going back, by the way, this, this, of course, this has been the consistent Christian teaching up until the late Middle Ages. I love this quote from St. Hippolytus in the third century. He said of God, quote, he thought of it, he thought of it, the cosmos. He thought of it, spoke the word, let there be light, and so made it, and so there was light. It came into being instantaneously exactly as he had willed it, unquote. So even though, of course, for God, all things are simultaneous and instantaneous, St. Hippolytus placed God's thought before the will, right? He first thought of the cosmos, then spoke the word and so made it. Now, I hope you will see the significance of this as we move into the very denial of it. And this is what we confronted in the 14th century, in the late Middle Ages, with William of Ockham and others of this same school of thought, which then formed the thinking of Martin Luther. Now, <clears throat> this new school to which I refer was called nominalism, after the Greek word nomen, meaning name, nominalism. And it is this school of thought that led to the fracture of medieval Christendom, though the formal break didn't come until the 16th century with Martin Luther. Nominalism teaches that universals or essences do not exist in reality, but are only names or contrivances. They exist only in the mind and they have no correlation to what exists outside of the mind. Remember Aristotle saying universals? The law of nature means that the law of justice is the same everywhere. It's universal. It's a universal. This here we're saying there are no universals. These um, names you have are simply conventions that you've created in your mind and they don't correspond to the reality outside of the mind. Since naming is the principal means by which we come to know things, the loss of the substantive connection between names and reality is, to say the least, devastating. Sundering words from reality broke the connection also between faith and reason and led to the development of political absolutism. Nominalism flips the relationship of God's intellect and will. So recall Aquinas said God's will follows upon intellect. For the nominalist, God's intellect follows upon will. God's will is primary, intellect is subordinate to it. And um, therefore the principle of intelligibility, the logos, that Anaximander posited, it goes. It's pure will that's behind reality, not intellect, not logos. The consequence of this, this Fernandez Santa Maria said, 
quote, Occam has done away with the logos, and all that is left in God is will, a will that cannot be bound or limited by the reason-inspired actions or assumptions of man, unquote. Pure will has no purpose, you see. It's not ordered to anything. Therefore, it's incomprehensible. Therefore, God becomes incomprehensible. And what God does is necessarily then, as a reflection of will, uh, not comprehensible. And one of the things he did was create uh, the universe, which then becomes unintelligible at least in principle. Now, Etienne Gilson, going back to him for a moment, I quote, having expelled from the mind of God the intelligible world of Plato, Occam was satisfied that no intelligibility could be found in any of God's works. No intelligibility. How could there be order in nature when there is no nature, unquote? Okay, so there are no essences. When I've just pointed out what language, what naming something does is apprehend its essence, and now we have uh, a philosopher saying, well, things have no essences. There are no universals. These are just conventions that man has created uh, that don't correspond or correlate with reality. So things, there are only singulars existing. This piece of wood, that piece of wood, there's nothing connecting the two of them. So were he consistent, he would say, well, we we don't, uh, so how could we have the word wood then? that would allow us to identify wood when we saw it again. In order to do that, we'd have to know the essence of wood. He says we can't know the essence of wood. So all we know are particulars, and there's no way to know uh, what associates one particular to another other than the fact that we make the association in our minds, right? So if I say you and you are human beings, doesn't mean you're really human beings. It means that I'm simply creating a name for the two of you, human being. Now there's a problem with this. You know, you have no laws of nature, right? You now have no laws of nature because that's what we mean by essences. And another fatality of that is we have no ethics either, because if things have no nature, we don't know what they're for, they have no ends. We can't tell with what, what they're doing is against the ends which they have inherent in them or contribute to the fulfillment of those ends. That, of course, is the basis of morality. Um, and it's also the, the foundation of justice, which is giving to things what is their due according to what they are. Well, if you can't tell what they are, how can you behave justly toward them, right? They're just singulars. Now, here's what the loss of nature leads to, and I'm going to inflict uh, some quotes from Occam on you so you don't think I'm just making this up. Wacom wrote, quote, it follows from this that it cannot be demonstrated that any effect is produced by a secondary cause. You know what that means? Now the secondary cause here would be gravity that makes the pen fall to the table. And Occam has said that there cannot be demonstrated that any effect is produced by a secondary cause. Then he goes on, even though when fire is close to combustible material, combustion always follows, this fact is nevertheless consistent with fires not being the cause of it. 
For God could have ordained that whenever fire is present to a close by patient, the sun would cause combustion in the patient. What this example of, of fire not cause of, of uh, fire not causing combustion was very popular with these nominalists in the late Middle Ages, as it was popular in the Muslim world too. So here, Robert Halcott in uh, the early 14th century stated, one cannot prove that fires cause, fire causes combustibles to burn. Like Occam, he said that it cannot be proven with certainty that one thing is the efficient cause of another. Even more, how can you do science? There you go. Even more start, Occam said we cannot even be sure who is human and who is not? <laughs> right? Right? Because the name that I tie you together with, I'll include you too. So there are three of you. That's just a name human being. But it doesn't mean there's anything in you uh, essentially that makes you human being. And therefore he concludes. Thus, there is no effect through which it can be proved that anyone is a human being, especially through no effect that is clear to us. For an angel can produce in a body everything that we see in a human being, eating, drinking, and the like. Therefore, it is not surprising if it is impossible to demonstrate that anything is a cause. I'll have to tell my children this. They will be very surprised. <laughs> now, another radical nominalist, Nicholas of Aston in Oxford, told his students that they probably were not certain that Nicholas was really a human being. <laughs> of course, I've thought that of some of my teachers, but... <laughs> If one cannot even tell what a human being is or whether someone is a human, what happens to the imago dei? What happens to the image of God in us on which the whole development of constitutional political order was based in the sac sacro sanctedness of the individual? The inviolability of the individual is the imago dei. You can't even tell if he's a human being, bye-bye, Amajo Dei. Nicholas uh, Aston made a further assertion that one could not be certain whether one is dreaming or awake. Another nominalist, Nicholas of Autricourt, went so far as to say the principle of causality is worthless and that the existence of the external world is indemonstrable. The existence of the external world is indemonstrable. Do you see the fissure between the mind and reality that this creates? The divorce between the mind and the external world? Of course, with this line of thinking, a reality collapses into incoherence. All we can know are habitual sequences, not causes. So we have no knowledge of the causes of things. We can't really know what they are. Now, Nicholas Aston went even one further. He taught that God can even change the past such as it never existed. This led him to assert that God can simultaneously will two opposites, that this does not exist and that this will always be, which defies, of course, the principle of non-contradiction articulated by Aristotle that a thing cannot be and not be at the same time in the same place, in the same way. So Aquinas repeated Aristotle's statement, quote, this alone is denied even to God to make what has not 
what has been not to have been, unquote. And so, um, and so we see this extraordinary radical break. A radical break which itself laid the foundations for the destruction of Christendom. So quickly I'll jump to Luther here, <clears throat> who was an alchemist, who was thoroughly imbibed the teachings of Occam. In fact, I'll speak to him. He says the nominalists among whom I was is the name of a school in the universities. They oppose the Thomists and the Albertinists, and they're called the Occamists after Occam the founder. The dispute was over whether humanitas and words like it meant a common humanity, which was in all human beings, as Thomas and others believed. Well, say Occamists, there is no such thing as a common humanity. There is only the word homo or humanity, meaning all human beings individually. Occam is a wise and sensible man, etc. cetera. So um, it is not surprising that being influenced by Occam, Luther should also come to the conclusion that God is incomprehensible and that reason has no ability to come to know him, which is at the foundation of the divorce between faith and reason in Luther and the extraordinary denigration of reason and philosophy in Luther. So he more or less takes the implications of Occam further and plays out uh, the consequences in his thought. Do you see the point if God is pure will and power? What, what access does your reason have to him and how, if there are no essences in reality, uh, could your examination of that reality lead you to knowledge of him. Well, it couldn't, right? Because there are no essences. So how could you come to know God? Ta-da, faith alone, right? Sola fides, the famous Lutheran teaching. Sola scriptura. We know only what God has told us. We have no independent access to him. Heretofore in Christendom and today in Catholicism, we would always say that faith is a rational assent. Yes, it's a gift of grace, but it's a rational assent. We don't suspend our reason, nor are we asked to believe in anything against our reason. So, therefore, we have this situation from Luther in which um, God is inaccessible. Reason is contrary to faith. I'm quoting him now. Reason is directly opposed to faith, and one ought to let it be. In believers, it should be killed and buried. Reason is the whore of the devil. It can only blaspheme and dishonor everything God has said or done. Does reason shed light? Yes, like that which filth would shed if it were set in a lantern. Got the analogy of what your reason is? You must abandon your reason, know nothing of it, annihilate it completely, or you will never enter heaven. Reason is the devil's greatest whore. She is a prostitute, the devil's appointed whore, whore eaten by scab and leprosy, who ought to be trodden underfoot and destroyed, she and her wisdom. Throw dung in her face to make her ugly. 
She is and she ought to be drowned in baptism. She would deserve the wretch to be banished to the filthiest place in the house to the closets. So that's where your reason belongs. This is a direct consequence of the underlying metaphysics that we find in nominalism and the underlying theology that says God is pure will and power and not logos and not reason. We are then therefore faced with this bifurcation between faith and reason. And there also goes, of course, philosophy. And you can read more immoderate remarks from Luther in his execration of Aristotle. Aristotle is the devil as far as Luther is concerned. And what is the most horrible book in the world? The Ethics. If any of you have looked at the Ethics, it's one of the most beautiful things human beings have written. And the Ethics is based precisely upon the moral nature of man, precisely upon that gift of speech which allows him to differentiate between the just and the unjust, the good and the evil, because of the ends to which his nature puts him, which is intrinsic to all humanity, which is not just a word. And therefore, um, Luther said, should Aristotle not have been a man of flesh and blood, I would not hesitate to assert that he was the devil himself. Any potter has more knowledge than these books of Aristotle, which I can only believe the devil has introduced. His book on ethics is the worst of all books. It flatly opposes divine grace and all Christian virtue, etc. Okay, now I'll just quickly go forward to Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes wrote the Leviathan. Thomas Hobbes is the absolutism to which nominalism ineluctably must lead. Thomas Hobbes was a sophist and a nominalist. He also found the nature of God incomprehensible. And you can hear his nominalism in this statement. I'm quoting from here. There being nothing in the world universal but names. For the things named are every one of them individual and singular. Unquote. Sounds right. That's exactly out of Occam. Um, quote, good and evil are names that signify our appetites and aversions, which in different tempers, customs, and doctrines of men are different. Nay, the same man in divers times differs from himself and one time praises, that is, calls good, but another time he dispraises and calls evil. From whence arises arise disputes, controversies, and at last war. Do, do you see the similarity between what Hobbes said and what... Um, Protagoras said at the beginning of this in Callicles, it's this, this idea of what's good and bad is only a convention that changes depending on where you are. And why is the convention formed? To satisfy your passions. You call good what satisfies your passions and bad the what frustrates it. So here we have at the foundation of the Leviathan, this kind of moral agnosticism. So, how do, what, what, how do we organize a, a political entity? This being the case, that everything is a matter of passion and convention. 
Ah, here comes the answer in the Leviathan, quote, it belongeth therefore to the sovereign to prescribe the rules of discerning good and evil. And therefore in him is the legislative power, unquote. Aha. He, so right is the rule of the strong. Here he is. Here's Thrasymachus, right? Sovereign is to prescribe the rules of discerning good and evil. Now, that is, in very short order, the foundation of political absolutism. There were two forms of this absolutism. One was divine right absolutism, as, uh, in, as in James I, you know, uh, his absolute power came directly from God. Not attenuated by anything. He, he was not subject to law, he was above it. And then the secular form of absolutism uh, in Hobbes, which it didn't matter whether uh, you know, it, the, it was any royal house or a group of people. It's the sovereign which constituted <coughs> what is right, and it is the state that decides and informs you as to what this is. Now, the sovereign now is at liberty to constitute justice in any way he chooses according to his will and how it serves his passions and interests, right? So how is he going to do this? Well, he has to use language. In fact, he has to abuse language to constitute his substitute reality. Because despite the nominalists, despite Occam, despite Luther, uh, things really do have natures. And our minds actually can apprehend reality. And reality isn't changed simply because you change the name. Thank you for finishing my sentence. If you can help me out in the rest of this talk, I'd appreciate it. Um, because reality isn't constituted by man or by his will. So I'm just at least quote from the abuse of language monograph here in which Pieper says, the place of authentic reality is taken over by a fictitious reality. My perception is indeed still directed toward an object, but now it is a pseudo reality, deceptively appearing as being real, so much so that it becomes almost impossible anymore to discern the truth. Unquote. Yes, that's exactly the problem. Vogelin spoke about uh, the, quote, the obsession of replacing the world of reality with the transfigured dream world has become the obsession of the one world in which the dreamers adopt the vocabulary of reality while changing its meaning as if the dream were reality, unquote. Remember, Nicholas Aston said we couldn't tell whether we were awake or dreaming. Mm -hmm. So this is the dream reality. We don't have time to go into this, so I won't, but this dream reality is all around us. And any of you who can get home tonight can get a, a, a direct experience of it <laughs> in these debates. Um, as some of you know, because you may have suffered through my talks on uh, my book, Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything, uh, that's one respect in which this is true in spades, is it not? There's a substitute reality in which uh, you can no longer speak of a man and wife as essential components in a marriage. So language is twisted around in this in a way that is uh, quite extraordinary. And the substitute reality 
is not only uh, emplaced in language, but now enforced in law. The consequence of this in the Analex Confucius taught, quote, if names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. If language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. When affairs cannot be carried on to success, proprieties and music do not flourish, unquote. That's a reference to my book on music. In any event, I now have a double zero. So I'm going to stop with final paragraph from Max Picard. <laughs> I would quote Orwell, but I, I won't have time to go Orwell. I just want to say the consequences of the false reality and the abuse of language. Though Max Picard is writing right after World War II, and he's referring to that, the same applies to us. Quote, truth can no longer reach man through the word, Truth that can no longer reach man through the word is made clear by historical events. The word of Christ had warned men against turning to evil, but as the word fell on deaf ears, events were sent to teach him. The ruin against which men had refused to be warned in time by the word was now revealed to man through the fact of the ruin of his own existence. Truth spoke not through words, but through the events of war and other terrors. As men no longer believed in the teaching that violence and hatred and crime should not hold sway among them, it was brought home to them by the fact of war. Unquote. And I fear this is the way the word will speak to us through our abuse of language. Thank you so much. I see many important people uh, came up with these philosophical ideas and spread it through institutions and it seems it gets spread then through the sovereign about the how the society will be. Uh, how does it get down to the people who live everyday life and don't go to schools where they hear any of this? Uh, today it could be media maybe or government or how is it happening? Well, unfortunately, the, the media are, are more on the side of Edward Bernays and the engineering of consent than they are on the side of Aristotle and Aquinas. And, uh, the, but when you see, the, well, there's one, re, one thing that uh, should leave us undiscouraged, and that is that reality is on our side. Yeah. yeah, despite the imposition, the attempted imposition of the dream realities, the false realities, um, it won't work because reality is still here. Things do have essences. Men and women are made according to the natures they have. And the true nature of marriage cannot be changed except by a tyrannical state that is ruled by the divine right of judges under which we are currently subject. But uh, we fought that once and we should fight this. And the thing to which we have, even though my, people's minds have been polluted by the newspeak talk uh, that people referred to that at a certain point they can no longer discern the truth uh, because the language 
through which to apprehend the truth is no longer available to them. That's, that, of course, is a big problem. Uh, look what happened in Nazi Germany with the imposition of that false reality or the communist world in the Soviet Union with that inversion of reality and how costly it was. Well, they didn't work. They can't work. And that they'll come down the sooner that we insist on telling the truth. And that can be told from the pulpit. It can be told uh, in the public with, for, for a price, right? It's going to cost to tell the truth. Forces of darkness do not like the light and they will attempt to extinguish it. So there's going to be a price to be paid. But that's a privilege, to suffer with him, right? That's the truth we're called to. So as Father Hezekiah said, we're born in the right time. We're supposed to witness to this. And uh, I see a number of callers in the room and we know how that witness is made. And for people like me who, who uh, are schooled in the way I can, I use my reason to try to do this. And uh, I, I don't, there, there's no bigger answer I can give you other than to pray. But does the dream world and video and Yeah, the dream world of video and the dream world of internet and all of these things people escape into. I had a, I was gonna mention this, I had a uh, episode last week on the Metro. I had to take a long, train ride from D.C. out to uh, Dunloring. And there in the Metro card was a group of college students. And they're obviously middle class, you know, well, well dressed, fairly well, no, not formally dressed, but well enough dressed. One attractive young lady, about seven guys. So I listened to the way they talked to each other. And of course, every third word was like. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, like, as like. And of course, it's a word without any meaning and it infests their conversation. So you immediately write off a third of what they're saying as meaningless. And then the rest was, of course, the, the profanity. The, the, the F word, of course, that comes so trippingly off the tongue. I was just sort of watching them, and I watched the young lady, and I could see there was no reaction in her to the use of that word, nor the slightest hesitation on their part in employing it. So between like and that, I thought, well, words have lost their meaning for these people. You know, they're, they're, they're engaged in, in something else because what they say, they don't even seem to register the meaning of the words they're using because in terms of the obscenities, they, they then couldn't use them. They couldn't. You wouldn't do that. A man in front of a woman? Unless you're a presidential candidate. Oh, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> sorry, I... Anyway, so, yeah, sir, so, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm very struck that when you talk about, well, follow it down to Luther and sort of the diminution of um, the reason and the elevation of the will, the divine will as you know, and the inscrutability of it or whatever, sounds so similar to what you said when you gave your lectures on the closing of the Muslim mind and what's going on. And so was there any, like, interplay between these two, two uh That's thoughts? a very good question. I'm writing a book uh, right now on the, in defense of the American founding from its Christian and natural law roots, and um, I, I had to change the chapter on Luther but I, because when I first wrote it, I pointed out all the 
similarities between Luther and Muhammad al-Ghazali exactly the same. And of Occam, it's, it's the, even though Luther, uh, he wrote a book about the Mohammedans, you know, and, and despised Islam. <clears throat> Nonetheless, it's the same, it's the same metaphysical and epistemological teaching. It's exactly the same. And in a way, and it leads to the same thing, which is a form of political absolutism. See, with Luther, medieval constitutionalism uh, was in place. The idea of representation, the requirement of, for, of consent, of no taxation without representation, that's a medieval political principle. Yes, the right to of of uh, rebellion against a tyrant, that's medieval. All of the principles that we think came from the enlightenment were enlightenment were actually products of the Middle Ages, but they were obliterated in the Reformation because Luther denied, for the same reasons Al Ghazali would. There is no requirement of consent. And therefore, what, what would you, their representation is meaningless unless there's consent. There is no right uh, to rebel against a tyrant. So the foundations of nascent constitutional government were obliterated. And of course, the two swords, one sword is eliminated, the church. <clears throat> no canon law, no, it's... it's uh, that, that was a devastating blow. And in my view, Luther led to Hobbes because um, Hobbes is Luther without the compensating redemptive power of Christ. See, the problem when you eliminate or downgrade reason, as Luther did, it, it's okay so long as you're still in a Christian society and people still live biblical morals. But what happens when they lose their faith? Well, then all oh, there's, there's nothing left. You can't repair to reason because reason has already been discredited. So you're left simply with pure will, the will of the sovereign. You're left with Hobbes' Leviathan. That's what you're left with. And that's what you get. And, and both Nazism and Communism were manifestations of that. And so is the divine right of judges, which we have developing here today. It's based all upon the same premises. Sorry, that was a little too long. Why, how, what brought William of Ockham to nominalism? What brought William of Ockham to nominalism? Um, It was, this, this would require a big, long thing. It was a dispute with the Franciscans over the definition of poverty and private property. And believe me, it's very convoluted, uh, and I, it, well, I certainly couldn't make it through that tonight, but... It, the, the essential concern was that if there are essences, as in a human essence or the nature of anything, that constricts God's omnipotence. Right? And that's the same thing Al Ghazali thought, that if things have natures, that somehow compromises God's absolute power because there's something, uh, you know, in semi-independent of them. Rather than Aquinas would say, no, they're expressions of God's uh, nature. They're, 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 they're not opposed to it. After all, God created these natures. And Occam and the others said, no, God has to be free to will anything. 
and therefore there can't be essences, and therefore everything has to be the direct result of God is the primary cause of things, and therefore, and therefore we can't be certain of any secondary causes, like fire burning cotton or gravity making the pencil fall. Okay, so that's, you say Father has a question? Okay. Final question. Um, so uh, in Plato's Cratylus, the titular interlocutor offers his defense of the absolute correctness of words. And Plato, through the mouthpiece of Socrates, offers a pretty damning refutation, um, which is then never very satisfactorily answered within the text. And I was wondering if you have um, a potential answer for Plato's argument, um, or would you consider that the Christian understanding of kairos is a sufficient potential answer for it? I think we'll wait till the divine madness talk to <laughs> address those. Could, would Father have a chance? He had had his, for the last, I'm sorry that I, I just, that's a bit too much for the moment. Oh, I was wondering, um, if you look at, you, you mentioned at the beginning you were drawing the connection between uh, the sophists uh, and modern advertising, and I imagine you, you'd put in there, say, Machiavelli, people who were um, advocating this idea of that we can manipulate language in order to then manipulate you know, reality. But it would seem to me that if you were to contrast those approaches, and even the approaches of, say, like the National Socialists in, in Germany, the Nazis, that one of the key differences would be that those earlier forms of abusive language were intentionally trying to be subtle. I mean, they were trying to put one over on people. They were trying to appeal to people as they, as they already understood things and just trying to tweak things enough to, to manipulate people to, you know, to get with the program, whereas it seems that this modern manipulation of language is very much kind of almost just a, a mob rule where on college campuses and other environments where you know, they posit these sort of anti-rational uses of language, like calling a man a woman or whatever you want to, you know, pick and choose as, a, as an example. And then and it's almost absurd on its face, but then when someone rebels and doesn't use the right term or, or um, you know, speaks in a way that's not approved, then they're just sort of, they're just sort of jumped on. And there's no, there's no sense of subtlety. There's just this sense of we have power and we're going to try to, you know, to kind of ram it down your throat. And can you maybe speak to where that that shift comes from, from you know rhetoric and sophistry as a as a as a subtle tool versus now a kind of stick just to kind of beat you over the head? Machiavelli in discourses said, "Quote: When it happens that the founders of the new religion speak a different language." the destruction of the old religion is easily effected, unquote. So this power of language, he compared it to using one's own language to infiltrate the enemy's thoughts with, with Rome's use of its own troops to uh, control allied armies. They put their own units inside allied armies. So I, you know, the... Um, I think what you're referring to is simply the level of degeneration that has been achieved here. The, the, the metaphysical and uh, the suppositions are the same. Um, I think when, when uh, Hobbes was writing, he still had to cloak um, what he was saying with a Christian veneer because there were still Christian societies even though the veneer didn't work very well and he was roundly condemned for what he wrote in the Leviathan uh, now that's gone the, I, so it's, I think it's a change in after centuries of trickle down uh, the, the, the ground level of society has been so affected and transformed by 
this false society that it doesn't seem to know its way back, which makes it very hard for us to speak about these things because they don't have the language within which to understand what we're, we're saying. Like, no, <laughs> like. <laughs> so that's part of it. The vocabulary is gone in a way. As, as people will um, tell me you shouldn't use natural law because no one will know what you're talking about. But there's a way, because after all, you know, you can change the metaphysical definition of something. That doesn't change the something. It, it, the, the, the reality is still there, and a true metaphysics is a, re, is a reflection of, a, a meditation on that reality. So reality is always there for us to appeal to. And, and the truth finally does resonate in people's hearts. It's just get finding it's a harder way to, it, it's harder to find a way to tell them the truth. Which is because this mobocratic abuse of language is so pervasive. Anyway, that's a stab at it, Bob. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. <laughs>